Incredible improvements in graphics have made VFR flying better than ever in simulators such as X-Plane 11. Today on The Flight Brothers, we will use free resources such as skyvector.com and FAA publications to explore navigating with these charts and visual sim references. The first item we're going to check out on these VFR charts is airports. The circle left of center on this map is Whittier, Alaska. And you can see on the map legend that the circle indicates an other than hard surface runway. And then you can see in the X-Plane 11 scenery, it appears to be a gravel runway. The airport circle for Whittier is colored magenta, which means it will not be a towered airport. Later we're going to see some airports colored blue, and those will be towered. The label Whittier in black text is actually identifying the town right beside the airport and not the airport itself. The airport's label is in the same magenta color as the airport circle. There's a ton of information included in these labels. The FAA uh, resource I'm using here had a sample, which is shown in this chart with all those blue, reflecting every imaginable piece of information you could get off an airport label. And it was pretty overwhelming and useless to look at. So let's take the Whittier one. We'll throw the data in the chart and see what we've got there. Whittier is obviously the airport name. IEM is the three-letter identifier, the sort you might see on your luggage tags or your airline tickets. Not very useful in the sim, not useful at all really. PAWR is the ICAL four-letter, and you can use this for the GPS. Uh, and if we were doing some heavy metal airliners, we would definitely use it for the FMC. The first number, 39, is the elevation in feet, and that is a true number. There's no zeros taken off, or 39 feet in elevation. You can use that in sim if you're calculating takeoff performance. Uh, it's good to know. Second number, 15, this is an abbreviated number. It's the approximate length of the longest runway with the last two zeros taken off. So in Whittier, we should have about 1,500 feet of runway, and we definitely want to know that for takeoff and landing. The italic frequency there, 122.9, is for the Aeronautical Advisory Station. Uh, don't really need that in SIM. And the circle with a C means that the airport follows the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF. Again, not really very useful in the SIM. Last, we have something unique to Alaska, and that's actually why I decided to uh, do this video here. The WX Cam. That is a weather camera. The FAA collects these, uh, this footage and puts it up on their website. It's free. You can use it. And as long as your sim is set to real-world weather, it should reflect the conditions in sim. So very neat little feature. Let's look at the next larger category of airport. We have moved to the map uh, to the southwest of Whittier to Kenai, Alaska. You can see two larger airports in the center here. Kenai in blue, meaning it has a control tower, and Soldotna in magenta, meaning it is not a towered airport. Both, according to the key, are going to be hard surface runways between 1,500 and 8,069 feet. Uh, we've also a little bit of extra added symbols here. Both airports have these little tick marks around them, and that means fuel is available there. You're also going to notice a little star at the top of each of the airport circles. And that means we're going to have a rotating beacon operating uh, nighttime, sunset to sunrise. The video in the bottom left is going to show the rotating beacon out at Kenai, alternating between white and green at night. Tucked partially under the Kenai airport circle, you can see a little anchor logo sticking out. The anchor denotes a seaplane base, and it's actually part of the Kenai airport. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't show up in X-Plane, but it's on the uh, Jeppesen charts. With the seaplane water uh, runway oriented just northwest of the paved runway, you can actually kind of get an idea for how they're aligned just by looking at the way the graphics are there. 
All right, so since Kenai is a larger airport, it's gonna have more information crammed onto its label. So let's enlarge the label. I put a little yellow border to help differentiate it from the uh, full sectional chart beneath. And let's start just going through these. The ones we talked about with Whittier, we're just gonna buzz through. Things that are new, we'll spend a little time on. FSS, that's for Flight Service Station on Field. Next line has all the airport identifiers, the name, Kenai, and then the three and four letter identifiers. The third line, CT for control tower, and it's frequency 121.3. There's a star and that tells us it operates part time, so you'd need to look up uh, the times that would be actually operational. The little C at the end is for CTAF being used there as well. Fourth line shows us the ATIS, or Automatic Terminal Information System. And this is actually one that's way more useful in x than a lot of those other details because you can dial this up on the comm and it will have automated local weather, your altimeter settings, which runways are in use, so you can actually use this part in the sim. The fifth line, still useful, just like Whittier, the first digit, 100, that's the field elevation. We have an L, meaning there's going to be lights at this airport, maybe uh, runway lights, taxiway lights, but there's a star, so that little star means there's limitations. It might mean it's going to be something you have to contact them. You might need to uh, key the mic a couple times to get them to turn on. You would need to look that up. The 78 stands for 7,800 feet of runway for the longest usable runway. The sixth line, that's kind of an oddball, since we have a sea base located inside the airport, it's getting its information here. So 97 feet is the elevation, and the maximum water runway is 4,600 feet. Last, the bottom line uh, shows us that there will be a right traffic pattern in use on runway 2 left, and on the water runway 20W. Moving north and east from Kenai, we'll look at the largest type of airport icon, Centered in the map is an icon depicting Ted Stevens, Anchorage International Airport, and slightly northeast from that is another large icon for Elmendorf Air Force Base. Both airports have hard surface runways over 8,069 feet, and the runway layout is going to be depicted in the icon itself. You may notice both icons have the blue star indicating a nighttime airport beacon, the sort we showed you earlier at Kenai. Both airports are in blue, so this means they are towered airports. If they were not, they would be in magenta. Let's zoom in on the Anchorage label. Let's see if we can decode it now without needing to use that large key. The airport name is abbreviated from Ted Stevens Anchorage International down to Stevens Anchorage. It is standard to drop the first names to make the airport name a little more manageable and uh, economical in space in the chart. The next line is the familiar three and four letter identifier codes. Then we've got CT for control tower showing a frequency of 118.3 on the next line. And an automatic terminal information system, the ATIS frequency of 135.5. Now hopefully you can decode this last line without me by now. The field elevation is 151 feet and the longest usable runway is approximately 12,400 feet, remembering they dropped those last two zeros when doing the runway length. And last, we have the Unicom frequency of 122.95. Now that we've seen the basic airport symbols and labels, let's move on to altitudes. You can get a general idea of the topography from the color coding. Each shade change denotes another thousand feet of elevation, and you'll notice the chart also includes white denoting glaciers. And that's one of the reasons I've selected flying in Alaska for this uh, video, because we've got these beautiful glaciers, and in uh, most of the rest of the United States at least, there's not much of that you're going to see. Let's go back to our close-up of Whittier from the beginning of the video. Here you can easily see the location-specific altitudes, especially the peaks. These altitudes are in black text with the dot showing the exact location that they're noting. These altitudes are not abbreviated or approximated, so they're not dropping zeros and they're not rounding up or down. Before we zoom back out, note the large blue 7 and the smaller number 0 in the center of this map. This is the MEF, or the minimum elevation figure. 
Going back to the full VFR terminal area chart, you can see that these blue numbers are all over the place uh, and they're always centered inside the rectangular grid framework that's over this chart. That grid actually represents 30 minutes of latitude change by 30 minutes of longitude change. Since we're so far north, the grid appears rectangular, but if we go closer to the equator, that grid is going to make nice, even squares. The MEF minimum elevation figure is going to tell you the approximate height of the tallest thing in that grid. So this is very important for planning and for general clearance, just safety. Whether that item is natural or man-made, it's still going to be uh, whatever's tallest there is going to generate the MEF. Um, when it's natural, it is calculated in a formula that is a little margin of error, some rounding up, and an obstacle clearance. You can read that to yourself there. Uh, I'm going to assume that the obstacle clearance is mostly for trees or other things that might vary from the uh, given height of the land mass. If a man-made obstacle, though, is the tallest thing in the grid square, then a slightly different formula is used. It's basically about the same, but they're going to get rid of that uh, allowance because you know, you're know you not going to have a tree on top of your wind turbine or your radio mast. So let's take a moment to look through the common obstacle markings. The small tent-like little triangular chevron is going to represent an obstacle of less than 1,000 feet. And the more tower-like graphic represents an obstacle over 1,000 feet. Sometimes these are going to be grouped together if they are in close proximity. And it's pretty obvious how that works. I mean, it, it looks like what it is. And there might be other information that's added. For example, this uh, lower right graphic here is showing some high intensity strobe lights on the obstacle. And they've got little cartoon like rays coming off, but they sort of evoke the blinking light that they're trying to represent. The altitude of these obstacles should be noted beside it with a larger number being the MSL or mean sea level height. So that's the, uh, the true altitudes. For example, if you're looking at the altimeter, that should be where it is. The smaller number is the above ground level height. So, you know, relative to the ground, that's how tall this thing is standing. So these MEF figures are gonna be incredibly useful for flight planning and safety, particularly in our non-pressurized GA aircraft where we have climb performance restraints and some altitude limitations. Before we wrap up this introductory VFR video, let's take a look at the few common landmarks that you might use to help navigate in VFR. Areas in yellow are not for topography, but represent populated areas. In the simulator, you should expect to see buildings in any of these yellowed areas. You can also orient yourself really well with the help of the roads and railroads when available. I frequently fly VFR around the Phoenix area because that's my home city. And in X-Plane 11, the road system is so accurately rendered that I can very easily navigate without even looking at the charts just by seeing where the freeways are. So if you found this video helpful, be sure to let us know in the comments below. We're considering another follow-on chart video where we might touch on airspace and navigate information. Certainly there's a lot more we didn't cover today. Be sure to let us know if that's something that would interest you. Till then, I uh, strongly recommend you check out the FAA's Aeronautical Chart User's Guide, which uh, if you like maps, it's just fun to check out. And that's the primary source for this video today, including all the graphics I've been using. A link will be in the video description below. I'd also really like to say thank you to skyvector.com for providing such an incredibly versatile and free resource, both to uh, simmers and real pilots alike. All of the maps you've been seeing today have come uh, from Skyvector. Be sure to subscribe for more sim and aviation content from the Flight Brothers. Until next time, plan the flight and fly the plan.